Welcome to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York. I'm Lindsay Berra, joined by MLB All-Star Carlos Pena and curator Gabrielle Augustine. And we're talking about the Hall of Fame Connections episode from a world wonder to the world champs. So from a 19th century world tour through the origins of the game itself yeah. all the way to the 2020 Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to believe that back in the 1800s, we were playing baseball, and that Albert Spaulding, so Albert Spaulding was a big baseball player at the time. However, he decided, you know what? I'm done playing ball. I'm gonna start my own sporting goods company, which ended up being probably the smarter move monetarily. Uh, and so he went and got together this group of ball players. He took the Chicago White Stockings, which are now the Chicago Cubs, and then took a bunch of other professional players and took them on a world tour. At first, it was only supposed to be to Australia, but on his way there, he's like, no, why stop there? We're going to keep going. <laughs> and so they hit up you know, Sri Lanka. They went to Cairo, Egypt. They went all the way through Europe, all the way back to New York. I agree. This, this is Spalding. Yes, Spalding. Because you, you look at the Spalding, and you're like, wait a second, and yeah, yeah. now this is the backstory. Okay, this Correct. is great. Yeah. yeah. And, and to all these places where baseball is, you know, it's just a hotbed of baseball activity, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, to spread the gospel of baseball. So, you know, he also makes some money on the side. Right? Oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right here, if you see this photo, you know, you can't do this today, but they all posed on the Sphinx. This is unbelievable. Like, look, look at the seats, right? They're, they're, yeah. There's people sitting, sitting. On, How much does a ticket on the Sphinx cost uh, pff, to today, watch a game? Today? <laughs> <laughs> too much, too much. That's, this is an awesome picture. Yeah, so after they posed on the Sphinx, they went in front of the pyramids and played a game oh. of baseball. In the, water, in the sand. Did they water the field or <laughs> they something? They did not. <laughs> so you can imagine all the accounts of this game. It went about as good as you thought it was going to go. You know, you go dive in a second, you're halfway covered and halfway buried in sand. You, you hit a ground ball and it just goes <laughs> 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 Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this Excellent. ball, if you want to put on your gloves. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the ball they used in that game? That is the ball they used in that game. If you, if you shake it, sand's going to come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> nope, no, oh, my gosh. This is so cool. Yeah, so this was actually then donated by George Wright, uh, who was on the tour and did play in a bunch of games around the world. He donated it to the Hall of Fame in 1942. So did they play games in all of these places? They like, did. Did Sri Lanka have a baseball field? Did they have to they had build to make facilities? They had to make their own. You, you count out the steps between the bases, you know, just like playing in the sand. <laughs> Does it feel like a ball to you? Does it feel like a... Yeah, well, it's it, a little bit lighter, light. would you it say? It feels a like lighter. four ounces instead of five, maybe. And the seams are really... Real flat. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to throw a curveball with this thing would be kind of tough. Yeah, or like even just to try to find the seams <laughs> to throw a fastball would be really hard. Even like fielding a ground ball yeah. and like throwing someone out, it would slip, especially if it's full of sand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so cool. No, yeah, and it is reasonably lighter. Mm -hmm. This one, is that a mummified baseball? <laughs> anything, we, you know. I like the connection, <laughs> but no. So this is the first artifact we ever accessioned into our collection in 1937. This is the Double Day Baseball. No way. Yes, yes, but yes. The first, everything has a first. It really does, it really does. Now, do you know the story of Doubleday and the, the invention of baseball. But you please tell us. Line us. <laughs> so, in the early 1900s, Albert Spaulding, who we already talked about, was having an argument, was in discussion with Henry Chadwick, who was one of the game's first historians, about the origins of baseball. Henry Chadwick, you know, he's a British guy, he, he came from cricket. You know, he went and he's like, yeah, it has, it has British origins, you know, rounders, cricket, all that, that's what baseball's coming from. And Spaulding's like, no, 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 no. It's got to be all American. <laughs> and so to prove his point, he formed a commission called the Mills Commission and basically had anyone write in their earliest memories of baseball being played. So this guy named Abner Graves, which we have this letter right here. Let me put this one. Okay. And he wrote in that he remembered Abner Doubleday, a Civil War general, Civil War hero, inventing baseball in Cooperstown in 1839. That is his earliest memory. Now, Spaulding was like, oh, this is fantastic. Doubleday is an American hero. He's a, you know, a general. He did great things during the Civil War. He's also dead. <laughs> you can't refute this claim. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and too, if you want to take a look at the letter. This is what makes it official, right? Oh, very official. Ex you extremely know? official. It's on like that, um, what do they call this paper, like onion skin Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like papyrus, <laughs> basically. Yeah, not yeah, quite, basically. but yeah, close, yeah. <laughs> 
a tosser stood beside the home goal and tossed the ball straight upward about six feet for the batsman to strike it on its wait, ball. Wait, wait. So the home goal? Home, uh, what is it called? It stood beside the home goal. So it kind of sounds home like someone throwing mound. you soft toss. What is it, home goal, the mound? That's what it looked yeah, like. Right. Some stood beside the home goal and tossed the ball straight, oh no, straight upward. Yeah, it's like, yeah. A, like soft toss. Mm -hmm. I like he calls the kid the lucky catcher, then taking his innings at the bat. This, this is, is amazing. Like so this it. is pretty much a description of what the game was in its origin. Yes, yes. So 1839. So that's try this? how. We should actually try to We should to go out and play this. that. Yeah, yeah this outside. is. So I will go ahead and toss it six feet into the air. And then mm -hmm. I have to try straight to hit up. it on the way down. It's like yeah. men's slow pitch softball. Basically. It really is. Yeah. yeah. So cool. <laughs> Amazing. And so that's how Cooperstown became the home of baseball. Yeah. But that's since been disputed. So, so where? So it was not originally no. started here in Cooperstown. No, it, it evolved from stick and ball games, primarily in New York City. I'm so. from New Jersey. We like to claim it started in Hoboken. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting another wrangle out there oh, because okay. we New Jerseyans okay. have to claim we did everything. All right, I'll have to get yeah. my baseball yeah, well, story on that. There are stories of, of, of the natives that lived in the Dominican Republic playing baseball. So we're right. like, oh, maybe we invented it. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. There are stick and ball <laughs> games that have gone back a millennia. So, you know, all versions. So, but that ball, yeah. like, uh, what, what's in it? <laughs> it is fa slowly falling apart. It's a <laughs> bunch of twine, you know, leather wrapped in twine. It was found in a trunk in Fly Creek, supposedly belonging to Abner Graves, who, you know, wrote the letter. And that's, you know, the Double Day Ball. And that's how it became a part of our collection. If I'm in the presence of this baseball yep. right here, mm -hmm. does it like give you powers to become a better baseball player? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been here five years and playing baseball through all of it. I don't think I've gotten better. No, so it, it so certainly I'm sorry. looks yeah. like it does. Yeah. It looks like it has a lot of power. I'm thinking maybe you're not addressing it the right <laughs> way. Maybe, maybe. Like, I haven't like found the magic like words Potter. yet. Yeah. You can probably talk to it. <laughs> it certainly you looks like you can talk. choose which team you go and play on. You know? How about this jersey right here? This jersey. So this was worn by Christy Mathewson in the 1913 and 1914 World Tour. So 25 years after Albert Spalding took his teams to the Sphinx and all around the world, the New York Giants and Chicago White Sox decided to repeat the whole thing. They played across the United States, and this is the jersey that Matthewson wore during all those games across the states. But then he decided, like, no, uh, I get seasick. I'm going to stop in California, and that's it. He didn't continue on the rest of the world tour. <laughs> but this is the jersey that he wore. So, you know, nice, heavy flannel. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. These I, uniforms, they're, I love they're that hot. he's like the diva in like 19, what year did you say it was? 1930. Like he's like, I am I'm out. Not <laughs> yep. in my contract. I do not do boats. <laughs> right, basically, <laughs> basically, right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So. That's pretty cool because, uh, I, I mean, we keep on seeing this. These older uniforms, they're very thick. I mean, yeah. so thick. I couldn't imagine playing in the middle of summer, let's say in Kansas City, for example, with that jersey on. It would be impossible. And you also have to wear something underneath it because they were itchy as heck. So, yeah. right. you, exactly. so you're wearing, you know, extra pants and an extra shirt and, and your wool stuff and the sweat just gets in it and all nice and heavy. Well, Seriously. the great thing about wool is that it does absorb moisture pretty well. So yeah. And it doesn't and smell. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that helps. It smells it like wet cheap, really. <laughs> yeah. Is that the worst? Man, this is this is cool, cool stuff. I I want to play in front of the Sphinx. I mean, what, what, can we arrange that? I wish I could. I, I just want to go to Egypt. You know? <laughs> yes. That's on my to-go go see list. So it's just pretty awesome. wild how the marketing junkets, you know, 140 years ago, were are basically the same as what they do today. Like, let's <laughs> bring this crazy idea to, yep. you know, who was the PR guy who thought of? Well, I guess it was Spalding it was himself. Spalding, yep. But like, you have this idea, idea, and let's just bring it to fruition because I have the money to do it. Exactly. Let's go. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. People sitting on the Sphinx. Yeah, you can't do that today, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. If you're interested in the people, places, and artifacts featured in this episode, go to baseballhall.org where you can plan your visit to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York, and discover your own connections to the game. Thanks for watching. For more incredible stories, check out our Hall of Fame Connection series. And don't forget to subscribe. Placada!